The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, March 9th, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Talking Data. This is our 40th edition today, and I'm joined by Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. I'm Kristen Radish, and I will be your host. Today, Jim and Ben will be discussing the confusing nature of investor flows. So Jim, we're going to get started with you. Bond investors have yet to pull the ripcord as financial media goes full bear. What are your thoughts? Yeah, everybody's making an assumption that because we've had a big rise in yields the last couple of days, or last couple of weeks, excuse me, and on Tuesday, uh, the 9th, when we're recording, there's been a bit of a reversal. But nevertheless, over the last two or three weeks, we've had a big rise. That must mean that there's this gigantic short in the Treasury market. Um, we don't have perfect data on it, but the data we do have can be somewhat representative of the larger whole. So if you look at the commitment of traders data to look at a breakdown of the futures market, or if you look at um, ETF flows, um, or if you look at opinion surveys, I don't see a giant short in the market. Now in the futures data, it needs to be adjusted a little bit. I know Bloomberg has run a couple of stories out there talking about a massive short because, and they really read like, Let's start with a let's start with a conclusion. There's a massive short. Now go find me a data point. Gerald, go cherry pick me a data point that shows that there's a massive short. Well, that's what they did. But if you look at the larger data, it's fairly neutral. If you look at the ETF flows, it's fairly neutral. If you look at the economists, who I like to beat up on all the time as being never right, they were always perpetually bearish as rates would always fall, being wrong. And now they've kind of backed off on their bearishness, which means how rates can rise uh, a little bit, but they're fairly neutral as well too. Now, this doesn't mean that the market isn't oversold by technical measures and can bounce, sure. But if you're looking for that capitulation type of peak yield that would mark the high of the year, from the data that I see, I don't see it. Now, there's a whole lot of other parts of the fixed income market that we don't have high frequency data on, maybe there's a big short in those parts of the market, but that would be very unusual to have it there and not be reflective in ETF flows and in futures flows because they kind of all move together to varying degrees. And right now it's not being shown. Yeah, I, I, I also always go back to the ETF flows. Yes, you know, in the cash market with the repo shenanigans we saw over the past two weeks, that maybe is a little emblematic of, uh, of a bigger short position. But really, investors have been slowly, slowly creeping back towards the governments and back towards sovereign bonds. And if you look at the rolling one month ETF flows into governments, namely treasuries, that the outflows kind of reached a peak somewhere in uh, October, early November, really ahead of the election, and have been slowly coming back. And now they're actually net buyers of uh, of treasuries, uh, particularly the short to intermediate term at the moment. So it's hard to say that I agree with Jim that there's been this big capitulation. It's just that treasuries and governments have been the forgotten asset class. You know, it's not that they have just gotten out in droves. It's just that investors have been shifting focus. And you can see that you know, perfectly. Just do a simple Google search trend for um, you know, governments, treasuries, safe assets, and compare that to things like dividend income. And it seems like there's this kind of transition that we've seen within portfolios and based on how managers are you know, allocating, and they're allocating more to dividends and uh, that type of income over treasuries. And it's not that they're selling their treasuries in droves. So I agree, we've yet to see the capitulation um, you know, I think uh, we'll right now we're kind of now up against a space where there's been tremendous flows into risk assets, while there's been a lack of flows into uh, bonds. And if you look at like on a disease score basis, rolling one month, that's as big as four standard deviations, that spread. Uh, there's signs that that's starting to narrow here going forward. And that's not necessarily a sign of, you know, a tremendous 
uh, you know, flight out of quality, it means we could actually see somewhat of a pushback into it over the next uh, number of weeks or months to come. Okay, yeah, I just, I'll conclude. Okay, let me just conclude real quick with saying I think, you know, my viewpoint is, yeah, if if 161 holds and we trade back down over the next couple of weeks to 140 on the 10 year note, I know the question will be, did we see the high yield of the year? And the answer I would probably give, barring some other major change, is no. I think it, it's still ahead of us. We've just found some kind of an interim step, but not that capitulation type of peak. Well, let me make one more real quick comment, because Jim, you and I have been talking a lot too about uh, the volatility and applied volatility measured by swaptions in the market and how we've seen a, kind of the, the short end or maybe two year versus five year, we've seen that uh, implied volatility pop to where we were just before, maybe slightly above um, where we were uh, during the pan right before the pandemic. And I think those are going to kind of be the values we should be watching go going forward. If that vol absolutely disappears again and plummets, which I'd be shocked, but if it did, um, uh, then I think we have the scenario where you know yields could fall. But as long as that concern, uncertainty remains there and maybe even grows, uh, this, this sell-off, this rise in yield is not over yet. Completely agree that interim volatility, like in the two to five year sector, is basically saying that there's some uncertainty about what the Fed is gonna do. And as long as that sticks around, that's code word for the market is thinking, man, we might have to force the Fed to move in 2022 as opposed to 23 or 24, like they say, that will help push yields higher. If that falls, then maybe we're back to the Fed won't move for two more years or three more years and the market can adjust to it otherwise. Well, Ben, next, why don't you walk us through the role of uh, credit investors right now? So yeah, credit, uh, you know, and Jim had some great charts yesterday, I'll comment real quick. The We've seen, you know, pretty persistent, you know, modest outflows from high yield to start initially. That kind of started maybe in August and September. Now it's followed by investment grade credit. So looking at like LQD and then versus HYG. And we've seen rolling outflows for the whole group of somewhere around maybe three to four billion on a, on a rolling one month basis. So again, we've seen this kind of money come out. Um, and something Jim will talk about is the amplified trace volume. We don't know if that money coming out of these ETFs means that it is money leaving the credit space. Uh, that's one thing that I think a lot of uh, pundits get wrong. A lot of times outflows could mean money going into cash markets uh, because a lot of these are kind of a store of value. It's a place to park assets. A lot of these funds do that. But, um, you know, one thing that's pretty wild is with the um, you know, incredible tightening um, in spreads, for example, triple C's to triple B's have come into about maybe 420, 425 basis points. It's been surprising that that continues, even though we've gotten this ETF outflow. So again, it kind of represents that maybe this money isn't necessarily racing away. Another thing too is, Yes, we've seen a tick higher in volatility. If you look at the implied volatility for LQD, HYG, uh, over the next month or three months, that volatility has come up a little bit, but really the ratio relative to the long end, I know we have a uh, duration mismatch, but relative, relative to something like TLT, that ratio remains really large. Um, so that means that higher you know, expectation for uh, long end volatility across the treasury curve. We still have kind of modestly low expectations for volatility within the credit space. That hasn't corrected itself yet. So this idea that you know, higher yields, people are going to freak out, isn't there yet. Um, I don't think it's causing this cataclysmic you know, race away from credit. Until I see those vol numbers converge, um, you know, I'm not too concerned, but I think that's something that's certainly on the horizon that investors need to be ready for at some point, um, you know, is credit finally getting a little more frothy. Yeah, just to add to what Ben was saying, um, you're seeing these outflows come, you're seeing this high uptick in volatility. And I would also add, if you look at HYG and LQD, you're seeing an uptick in put buying as well too. Okay, let's look at spreads. Are they widening? Not really. Um, you know, there's a little bit of widening on the investment grade side, but I think that could be more attributed to higher overall interest rates than riskier credit. And it isn't a whole lot anyway. But if you look at the trace volume of the cash bonds that are trading, that's going up. Now, higher, vol higher volume in the cash market doesn't tell you the motivation or whether who's buying or who's selling. But if you told me 
that you've got outflows, and I'll call it the macro traders, outflows out of the ETFs, increased put buying, people that are trading high yield investment grade as a macro theme, and you've got increased volume on the actual bonds and spreads are narrowing. That suggests to me that either A, they're moving out of ETFs and into cash bonds, or B, there's just more cash bond real buyers that are coming into the market. And that I think is actually somewhat positive that they're able to withstand these macro sellers. And I also would argue that on a longer term basis, I've always been worried about this macro trading. If there's no more idiosyncratic market than high yield, I don't know what it is. Each individual bond is different from the next. You shouldn't be lumping all the high yield bonds together and just trading them both going up or down. They're all different. And if we're gonna go back to trading them one bond at a time, I think that in the longer term, that's better for that market than having it being overwhelmed by, you know, hot money running into the ETF and pushing all the bonds up and hot money leaving the ETFs and pushing all the bonds down. That was the case for the last couple of years. We're starting to see that maybe that's not the case now. And I think if that continues, that's probably a good sign. But larger picture, the cash market volumes are going up as these macro traders are coming out and the spreads are holding in. So those cash market guys are seeming to be a lot more aggressive or maybe the ETF money is shifting to the cash market. Either way, it seems like it's a positive development for credit. Let me make a quick tangent here, um, uh, going in a little bit different direction. But so the amount of money that's still, you know, maybe going into the cash market, you know, mildly coming out of uh, of the ETFs. The big thing I think that was on the horizon we got to watch for credit investors is going to be real yields and the dollar. So if we were able to see real yields and the dollar continue to rise, which has been the case as of late. You know, historically, that's been a period where uh, there has been selling of those cash bonds and we have seen spreads widen. So if you're looking for the scenario out there that could finally rattle credit markets, I think it'd be an appreciable rise in real yields and in the do U.S. dollar at the same time, which historically has been pretty damaging for longer duration credit. So we'll see if that happens to be, to be the case. Sorry for the tangent. <laughs> it's a good one. Jim, next we're going to turn over to equity flows. Why are equity flows heading to value in U.S. destination during global synchronized growth? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things about um, equity flows and a couple of things about what's going on bigger picture. Um, when you have a big run up in a market like you've had over the last few months, I always like to say every correction is a function of the previous advance. So if you go back and look at the S&P since September, it's had a massive run up. The uh, Russell 2000s had a massive run up. So if you're going to, uh, you know, the biggest run up of all has been like in, um, you know, uh, technology companies don't have profits. The Goldman Sachs non-profitable tech index is up nearly 100% since September. So if you're going to have a correction in that stuff, you don't correct 3%. You correct 30% if you've been up 100. You correct 10 or 15% if you've been up 30% before that. So the correction you've seen is a function of the previous advance. Um, and that's why it's been what people think of as large, but if you look at it on a retracement basis, I don't think it's been as large. There has been a rotation into value uh, as well. Now there's two things that are going on there. One is there's this game that all these economists are playing is, can you top my 2021 real GDP forecast? And uh, now I've heard, um, uh, economist out to today that's now up to 9% for the full year. You know, let's just keep, uh, you know, I dare you to go to 10, you know, it's basically what uh, is, is what they're doing. The point is we know it's gonna be a big number. We know it's going to help the more traditional companies. So you've seen this movement into value stocks versus growth stocks. Second of all, what is the biggest sector in value and growth? The largest sector in value is financials. And the largest sector in growth is technology. And as a matter of fact, I'd almost go as far as to say value growth is almost just looking at the tech financial ratio. It's nearly, we had a chart in news clips yesterday. It's almost identical. The two charts are, are of each other, uh, just varying a little bit in degree. So financials have been benefiting from a wider yield curve and technology has been correcting because it had such a massive rally ahead of this that I, I get it that everybody's looking at this being some kind of a larger rotation, and it might be, 
because of the big growth rates. But right now, it just looks like it's a tech financial type of correction. And if interest rates are going to back off a little bit here, so will financials. And tech being the longer duration asset that needs lower rates will rally. And all of a sudden, we'll be back into a growth spurt one more time. Whether that lasts remains to be seen. Yeah, I think it's it's one thing too I've noticed that's kind of um, odd is that with this expectation of global synchronized growth, some of these uh, kind of investments that investors are choosing are a little different over the past number of weeks than they were uh, maybe a month ago or so. So we've seen a pretty big deceleration in money leaving the U.S. for foreign destinations, be it uh, fixed income in particular in, in emerging markets in Europe and Asia Pacific. Those flows on a rolling uh, three-month or one-month basis have been cut almost by 75%. There's still inflows, but uh, dramatically less in nature. Same thing somewhat in the global equity space. So there's all of a sudden money coming back to the US and where that money is going is predominantly into what Jim just kind of said, financials, but then also some of the other lower beta sectors, things like industrials, materials, and if you can say energy, um, those are comprising, you know, better than 50% of the 60 plus billion dollars on a rolling three month basis that's going into sector focused ETFs. So the you know the, it's kind of a little different than what I would have expected um, you know with the big global synchronized growth story it's kind of shifting in nature maybe it has to do with the U.S.'s ability to get the vaccine out and potentially higher growth and other some other developed economies and only time will tell. But getting back to it, if that is the focus, we're coming back to the U.S. Real yields going higher, U.S. dollar gets stronger. Historically, that's been almost the best scenario, not necessarily for returns, but relative returns for value relative to growth and really anything else. So if I look at all major asset classes, value tops the list in terms of ability to weather the storm of rising U.S. real yields and rising U.S. dollar in terms of it's actually strengthening. Um, and that goes across all asset classes. I don't care if it's treasuries, uh, munis, MBS, it's um, you know, commodities and so on. So you know the, the scenario might be there, might be ripe for this to continue, but like Jim said, what's steering all of that are, is really interest rates. Um, so if interest rates go back down and you know, real yields go down, yeah, party on for, for technology. If not, then you know, then 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 things are going to continue to change and shift towards value. Finally, for these poor value managers that have struggled. Jim, any final thoughts? No, I, I agree with a lot of what Ben said. In fact, I agree with all of what Ben said. I think it all comes down to you know when you said interest rates going down, party on. It really comes down to the view of inflation. Uh, yeah, nine percent growth. Um, you know, if, if we were to get some kind of monster number like that or seven, which is where um, Goldman Sachs is. I mean, these are the highest numbers since the 8% growth in 1984. So these would be, you know, 37 year peaks in the market. Question is, how much of that gets leaked into higher prices in terms of inflation? If we have inflation, then we're going to have problems with real yields expanding and everything else. If we don't, then it is party on. So the inflation story will be very critical. And what's going to drive the inflation story? Later this week, we should pass the uh, the rescue American Rescue Act. The $1,400 checks will go out. The extra unemployment will go out. Then $1.9 trillion stimulus will start to kick in. And then the question becomes, second half of the year, does it produce any kind of inflation? Well, thank you both for your thoughts today. We appreciate it. And thank you to our audience for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is a research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information or any questions at all, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.